So this is the firm of the future and it's working on your business, not in your business. Many of you who were part of the 2020 group are very familiar with that phrase. So we'll carry on. This is a firm called Indeniro and this started in around 2009 in California. So as we go through these, I'm gonna just kind of flip pretty quickly. Her name's Jessica Ma. She raised a million dollars in venture capital. In 2014, she had 70 employees, 25 in San Francisco, 45 in the Philippines. There is someone gonna speak later on outsourcing, and that's really partly what has driven the growth in her company, is one of it is outsourcing. I wanna push down, she started in 2014 at 2.9 million after 2009, so she had grown it. Projections for uh, 2022 uh, far exceed 14.7 million. Uh, wasn't in the budget, but I suspect from the growth that we see here, she's planning to probably reach 16 or 17 million without a doubt. One of the other things that you're gonna find out about her is that she does everything online. And here's her statement. When we started in De Niro in 2009, we knew that of all the industries out there, accounting and tax was one of the few that had ever been modernized. Show of hands who would agree with that statement. Yeah. So here's what she's done. There's no paper in her firm. Clients see what's happening 24 seven. Everything's in real time. Social media, uh, how many here use social media for their firms? Okay. Uh, only act for service businesses. This is what she does. Three levels of service, and she has essential growth executive right on her webpage. One of the other firms I'm gonna talk about a little later does the same thing. All fees are fixed and paid automatically. You know, I think there are a number of this room who uh, the worst day of their life is sending out their invoice because they get yelled at. You know, when you have a fixed invoice and they get it each, each month or each quarter, whatever happens, it takes the pressure off. Your clients know. So if you aren't doing the fixed fees and you don't have these three levels of service, I would really encourage you to look at that. So now we're going to talk about why doesn't Starbucks sell Coke? I'm just curious. Any ideas? Why doesn't Starbucks sell Coke? Larry? Because everybody else does. Everybody else does. When you go into a Starbucks, you're only gonna get Starbucks products. It's, it's, it's really how they grew. And this is one of the things about a highly focused firm. You're gonna do one thing, and obviously your tax, there are gonna be a couple of things you're really good at, but you wanna be focused. We all know about the hedgehog. We saw a similar uh, graph like this in Carrie's. But here's what a, a great firm looks like. It's passionate, it, they're good at what they do, and they're very profitable. You know what, let's be honest, being profitable. Who wants to be profitable? I mean, we're not gonna work this hard if you're not gonna be profitable. So these, you know, how many do a budget for your accounting firm? Excellent. I would really encourage you at the end of the year, or, or even now, looking at what your budget is for this year, what you're gonna do next year. Because I bet you you're telling your clients to create a budget. And it's the same thing with your own firm. Here are some of the things that you can offer. How many do CFO services? I know there are some in this room. Very profitable, so you're gonna move your firm up to basically 10,000 a month. And I think that one of the key things as a CFO if you're doing this, you need to communicate. You know, this is what your client expects. We had, uh, I remember an accountant telling me that uh, he picked up a, an, an account uh, and it was probably one of these $10,000 a month. And he said to the client, oh, I can get this work done for you down to $2,500. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't even believe he's talking like that. And what happened is, he never was on time with the reports. The client said to him, look, I don't mind paying you $10,000. I just want to know what you're talking about. I want the reports on time. It's, an, it's really simple. They respect what you have to say and just be honest with them and be on time. And this is what the $10,000 can get you. But most of it is being on time and, and, and communicating. 
How many offer business advisory services? Excellent. Here's basically in the business advisory services, here's what you want to be looking after. Strategic planning, profit improvement, benchmarking, KPIs. Do we all know what KPIs are? In your accounting industry, what's a KPI? In your firm, what's a KPI? Recoveries on file. Recoveries on file? How quickly the invoices are paid. Yeah, exactly. How, okay, how quickly the invoices are paid. What's the average time turnaround for an invoice to be paid? 30 days. 30 days? Excellent. How do you get it faster? Sorry, Larry. Actually, I find they are either paid within 30 minutes or after. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, everybody is sending their invoices out electronically, correct? You're not sending them out by mail. Please tell me there's nobody in by mail, because you can tell it's not going to be 30 days. Good. One of the other big areas to in increase revenue, of course, I can't do this uh, talk without suggesting that you integrate wealth management. And we work specifically with uh, accounting firms. And the reason we do that, and here's a perfect example in October and November, we want to talk to the accountants with their clients because there's some tax harvesting, harvesting to be done in the next couple of months. You know, with the markets down, uh, this is an opportunity to go back with your clients and look at some of the tax returns. This is really why we want to work with accountants because we can become the financial team around the client and the client benefits. And you benefit and we benefit. It. Modern firm is different. Here is something that's really special. We were in an accounting firm in uh, Columbia, and when you walk in the door, you get a beautiful uh, glass and it, it, with a beverage of your choice. Can you imagine if a client came into your office and it's you know, just for a coffee? and the coffee's ready, or who's ever at the front offers the client a coffee, but better yet, you actually knew what the client wanted in the coffee. So when the cl client arrives at 10 o'clock, you know, maybe you called them yesterday and said, you know, you're gonna be in at 10 o'clock, we're gonna have a pot of coffee on, can I have it prepared for you? What, what are you taking your coffee? It's just one more thing. Can you imagine the client comes in and the coffee's ready? It's a little thing, it a, costs a dollar. But you know what? The satisfaction level has gone way up with the client. And I'm going to give you one more suggestion on the saying being uh, the client experience. I did this talk with a bunch of, um, in, I did this in Columbia to a, an army group. The room was filled. And I thought, what am I going to talk about the client experience? What can I say to this group? And I said to them, what if somebody said thank you to you for the work that you did? The clouds, the whole group erupted because I'm sure in a, in a military uh, experience, they don't get said thank you. They don't even get told thank you for the work they were doing. It doesn't cost anything. And this is what really, to, even to your staff, saying thank you, it's key. Strap line or key line? This is some firms crunch numbers and we change lives. So if you've got this on your website, if you've got a really cool tagline, you know, look at what you're saying and believe it. So the pull approach to attract new clients. There are two different methods of marketing. There's push where you send out all of your minutia, you keep sending out stuff, or there's pull. There's certain things that you can do that's going to attract clients. They want to be part of you. Maybe they're reading about your firm in the news, that you've done something spectacular. So you know, look at some of the things that you're doing to pull new clients in. And it could be wealth management. Maybe they found that you're doing wealth management. I want to work with a firm that's integrated, that I can go to them and say, here's my tax return. How do I do, do differently? And how can I maximize with my wealth management? Have a killer website. Is there anybody in here that doesn't have a website? I know it'll be really hard for you to pull up your hand. But if you don't have a website, you need it. You know, nobody even goes out for dinner anymore without looking up the, the restaurant. And here are some of the things that you have to have. This, this should be old news, but uh, content, footprint, and reputation. This is a company called Bloomer in the United States. Killer website. It has been updated uh, to Carrie's uh, new house. Um, 
this is a full disclosure. Last night I was looking up Bloomer's, because I'm a late night person, looking up Bloomer's website. Of course, it's all changed since I've done this. It's actually much better than even this, but let me just walk you through these slides. We are a CPA firm, and we want to equip creative people to become mature business owners. Pretty simple. Who we are, who we serve. I don't know how many times I've talked to accountants who are really afraid to talk about who they serve. You know, if you're in a niche market and you do, a, you know, maybe you do dog groomers, maybe you, whatever you do, you know, clients want to know who you serve. So don't be afraid. Ask the client if you can use their name on your website. They're probably going to say yes. And it's an opportunity to say who you're working with. Build content. And, you know, here are just a number of things to have. Um, on your website, e-newsletters, webinars. Uh, for those of you who are part of the wealth management uh, with us, we can help you with webinars. We can do these things to help you with clients. We have lunch and learns. So these are the things that help attract clients and keep them. Freebies. It's always good to have something on like a white paper. Uh, you know, CRA has all kinds of stuff that you can put on your website if you don't, that you can give away just so that you're on top of doing things and, and keeping your client things that are useful to them. Maybe it's a budget, it's all kinds of things. Just look through some of the materials that you have and put it on your website so they can download. Uh, communicates consistently with clients and prospects. Uh, I want to say that. This is one of those things, probably through COVID, some firms did a really good job on communicating with their clients of the, for instance, some of the uh, plans that were given away by CRA. Some, some didn't even uh, communicate with their clients to say that they were, that they were uh, um, grants available to them. It, but I would really encourage you when CRA or when the government gives you opportunities to tell your clients that their grants available, they'll be really happy. Uh, Bruno is in the, in the room here and Bruno was very, very uh, outstanding during, C, during COVID in letting clients know about grants that were available. And we were pretty thankful because we actually benefited from that. So I, I would really encourage you when uh, there are things that are happening in the, in, uh, in the environment or in the economy that you take advantage of some of the offers from the government. These are just some examples of uh, community human interest stories so niches how many in this group have a niche would they say that you have a niche in your accounting firm carlos what is it community. perfect larry IT profession. fantastic anybody else todd you have a really unique one um, international tax international tax so there you know these even within this room, there's some really spectacular niche. And they, sometimes they say, if you have two or three clients in, in one industry, you have a niche. What's the, be, what's the benefit of that? Well, obviously, if you've got three or four in an industry, it makes, you know, you can have internally, look at what so-and-so is doing in their business. You can do some projections based on uh, what one client has. You've got opportunities to do ratios, saying this is what this firm is doing, this is what that's firm. You can become an industry expert just by having two or three firms in one industry niche. Okay, so here are some of the challenges that we know, and I want to address this. Attracting the next generation and keeping interest in their jobs and, and uh, simulated by their work. I know that right now it's been very difficult to get uh, staff and keep staff. And who, who is, who's experiencing that right now? Yeah. So here are some of the, uh, the needs. In the millennials, they want self-actualization. They want, basically, they're not going to work the way we did uh, for 30, 40 years ago when we all got, when you got your CAs. You know, sometimes it was taking two or three days to complete a project. And I know that there are uh, programs out there that can do some of that work in two hours. You get to charge the same thing. But let those uh, young people develop those programs because it's fantastic and they can do it. You still charge the client the same thing. And here's what they want. 
no paper, mobile devices, the latest cloud-based apps, and mobile monitors. So this is an old, uh, we used to say two, you should have two, uh, two monitors, three is the new two, and now we're at four. I just saw a monitor that went into our office yesterday that was fantastic. It is one monitor, it's kind of on an arc, and you can subdivide it so you don't even have to have the brakes in here. What is the beauty of having these multiple monitors? It's moving things back and forth, it's having data available. It was said when the first double monitor came out that you increased capacity 40%. That's a really cheap way to increase capacity in your office. And so that's just, a. and this one, of course, you can see that they're vertical monitors. So it's just, there's so many options out there right now. And I'm telling you, the young people in your office, they know what to get. It's, you know, listen to them because it will change your life. This is an interesting firm that I went to in Colombia, and I was talking to them on the firm of the future. When I walked into that office, I felt like I was in the firm of the future. I'm talking Colombia. Look at how beautiful it was, and everything was clean, everything was tucked away, there was no paper, but there was something missing. Who, who can see it? No double monitors. They, they, they had no idea. I'm telling you the next day they went out and got double monitors. So another important thing for your staff is training. You need good training, you need leadership training. I wanna to talk to you right now. We have a lady in our room, Julia Novak. Julia, do you just wanna stand up so they know if they wanna come and talk to you after? Julia, we've actually used Julia. She does great leadership training, but here's the best part. Julia has looked for grant subsidies that the government will provide you. So in many cases, you're gonna get a really good opportunity to do training at a reasonable price. So, you know, at the breaks, reach out to Julia, find out more about the programs, because, you know, it's really important that we continue to train staff. Oh, this was, this again was this firm. It was a boardroom, you know, everything's tucked in the walls. It turned into a training room. So yeah, this is, and so here we are training and, and it was, honestly, it was the firm of the future with basically without the double monitors. They were doing everything right. Here's what the young people want. An individual contract, specific goals, quality rewards, regular reviews. Who, who's doing that with their staff right now, with especially young people? Fantastic. Opportunities for growth. They want to see inside the firm, outside the firm, in the community. I'm, obviously, during COVID, it's been a little difficult with staff because you know nobody's coming into the office. It's hard to build community. But I think we are past that right now, and we need to look at opportunities that we can engage our staff, engage uh, them in the out, in the office, outside. It's absolutely important. Again. If you've read Good to Great, you've got to get the right people on the bus in terms of staff and the wrong people. Some people are toxic in your office and they need to be gone and they're not doing the job. You know, although it's difficult to find people, if you've got someone in your office that is uh, basically creating havoc, uh, I really would suggest that you evaluate your staff and get the wrong people off the bus. And this may even just be the wrong client. If you know that you've got a client that is giving you grief and they're taking way too much time and they're a D client that you never ever can foresee them being an A client, you need to get rid of them. They take too much time. It's like the $5,000 client versus a 10 million. It's an opportunity. Look at your client list. Normally I would suggest that you do this after tax season because there will be a client that your staff say, do we ever have to do them again? No, give the staff the opportunity to get rid of a bad client. This is, I mean, this is the modern firm is in the cloud. We all know this. And uh, here is the last part uh, about zero entries. You know, QuickBooks Online, there are a number of accounting firms that, uh, pardon me, accounting programs, uh, bookkeeping programs that are available now that make life so easy. How many people in the room are doing bookkeeping in their office? What's the benefit of doing bookkeeping for clients? Does it not make tax season a lot easier? 
So, you know, if you've got an opportunity that you know someone who is really good at bookkeeping, then they're really keen on QBO, probably a good person to have in your office and start to bring the bookkeeping in-house or outsourcing it. Here's the opportunity. We can say we can work anywhere now uh, because of some of the online programs and basically the internet has turned out to be so good and during COVID we all learned to do to work off uh, outside the office really well through Teams, through Google Meetups. Uh, there, maybe there are a lot of other programs out there but we've learned to work anywhere now. Collaboration. And this is where you basically, I'm still having a little difficult time because we're all working on some of the same pages and I usually end up you know, doing it offline and bringing it in-house and then Shelby has to rework something, but I really have to work better at this personally. But there's all kinds of opportunities to work together as a, as a team. So here's what the modern firm looks like. Paperless, cloud-based, fixed fees, uh, no receivables, everything in real time, and I really encourage you to have the, you know, on your website your programs that you offer because it actually lets the clients know what they're paying for and what they're getting, and they can be available 24-7. Um, where is this going to lead? The new accounting paradigm is permanently changing the profession, or is it just a flash in the pan? I think that the new accounting firm has changed. I see it in a, in a number of the firms that we work with, with the way they deal with their clients, the way that they communicate. So I think actually the accounting profession over the last couple of years, because of COVID, has really moved forward. That's it for my session. Any questions? Okay, here. I think the biggest issue that, that we're finding it's the same in the room. There's, there's the, the, the need to go find new clients isn't there. There is it's kind of reigning clients, and, and larger firms are cutting and, and you know, it's coming down. Our, our biggest issue is you know, you, you, you see a client, you want to take them on, and then you realize, well, who's going to do the work? And that's, you know, I think the biggest issue we're having right now is people issues getting enough people. Um, last year we had someone signed a contract, everything else went in, resigned the next day, and the firm he was working for gave him a $20,000 bonus to stay. Yeah. I mean, you can't compete with that. So uh, I, I agree that you always have to be looking on the marketing side, and you always want to be able to find the next clients. But right now, the hardest part that we're dealing with is having the capacity to serve what we have. And I, I don't, this is a little bit of a different dynamic. We've always had sufficient capacity and now it's hard to get people. All, all the big firms have popped uh, the amount that they give the first year students coming out of university right now, either by 10 or 20,000. I heard that, yes. So I don't have the answer for that, but what I do know is if you have a student that goes to a big firm, they get pigeonholed. They don't get the experience that they get in a, as a room in, like this. They get way more opportunities, and that's what you have to basically, you know, let these people know that there's opportunities that they will never get in a big firm. The other thing is, I would suggest um, co-op students. If you're not using them, it's a great opportunity because you know they they have to have these terms. And once they start working for the small firms and the opportunities that they see within that firm, you'll get to keep them longer. We, you can't always compete on price, that's for sure. They don't get big increases once they get into Well, they usually get let go. <laughs> that's the problem. They usually run away. Yeah. <laughs> After a certain amount of time. So. Yeah. It's, it sounds great when, you know, it's really good to say that you got hired by the big four. It's also really good to have that on your resume. But the breadth of the experience that you're getting to get in a smaller firm outweighs it. Any others? So, Peggy, I didn't have problems until just the last year and a half. Yeah. You know, as far as getting, uh, getting individuals. Uh, but the last year and a half, two years, maybe because of COVID, but no, I don't think COVID had anything to do with it. Uh, I now have the same problems as everybody else have as far as getting staff. But up until a couple of years ago, I was, because I targeted a certain community that was easy to get, and I had really good systems, I was, 
down fighting in the last year and a half, two years. It's just as hard. Carlos, I think it's the same in all industries, and it's no different in Canada or the United States. I spoke just to several people uh, over this holiday. Uh, didn't matter what industry they were in, they were having difficulty getting staff. Uh, you know, let's be honest, COVID and the government grants that were being offered, people were saying, you know what, I can just stay home. And they're, you know, it's not worth going back. You know, by the time I add in babysitting fees and all of the things, I can stay home and cheaper. So I think that we, we we're up against that. It's the same in the States. The gentleman that I was talking to uh, run uh, an, an eye ophthalmologist firm. Can't get people. Dentists. It's the same in all the industries, so I don't know what the answer to that is.